Fatal Ali, a faculty member in the Educational Studies Department and a member of the Arts Research and Scholarship Committee. And uh, we are grateful to the uh, speakers and all of you for taking the time to attend today's presentation entitled the uh, white men have taken our land and we have never got anything. Kwantlen, Katsi, um, Kwokwetlem, Moskwem, Samehmu, um, and Tawasawan First Nation uh, Sovereignty, uh, 1910s, uh, which would be presented by Dr. Madi Knickerbocker, a um, faculty member in our history department, along with Natasha McConnell, a history BA student at KPU, and a future UBC student, uh, UBC MA students, which is exciting. Um, in a moment, I'll invite the presenters to introduce themselves. But before we begin, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that we at Kwantlen Polytechnic University respectfully acknowledge that we live, work, and study in a region that overlaps with the unceded traditional and ancestral First Nation territories of the Musqueam, Katsi, Semiahmu, Tuwasawen, um, Kaikat, and um, Coquitlam, and with the lands of the Kwantlen First Nation, which gifted its name to this university. Uh, in the cause of reconciliation, we recognize our commitment to address and reduce ongoing systemic colon uh, colonialism, oppression, and racism that indigenous peoples continue to experience. Um, and so we hope that you will attend and register for all, all the art speaker series. Um, in case you missed it, you will have received an email with an invitation from arts events. Please take a moment, register, uh, and uh, you'll get um, the entire information about the entire series in your inbox. Um, and also, I want to invite you to join us for the next art series presentation on Wednesday, November 20th at the same time at 1 p.m. Uh, the title of the next presentation is An Interdisciplinary Approach to Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, uh, which would be presented by um, Leland Harper um, from our philosophy department. Now, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping before I pass it on to the presenters. Um, first, please place yourselves on mute, everyone, throughout the presentation and have your camera set to off. The chat function will be used for questions and comments, and I'll try to um, keep track of questions uh, for the end for the presenters to go through them. And um, finally, we will be recording the session and uploading it to the Faculty of Arts YouTube channel for access in the future. We'll have time for discussion at the end. We're hoping to have about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and you're welcome to ask questions using the raise your hand function to write, or you could write your questions in the chat. And now I'm excited to hand things over to Maddie and Natasha, who will lead us in a very thought provoking and essential discussion. Great, thank you so much. <clears throat> Aswell Mekwawat, Maddie Nickerbocker, Tulsquich, Tsatsul Sol Huyawal, Tulsqualawal, Kuals Machui Ska Taf Waloop. Hi, everyone. My name is Maddie Nickerbocker, and I'm very happy to be at this gathering with you. Uh, as Fatima said, we want to begin by affirming that we are on unceded and untreated land, stolen land. Um, of the Kwantlen, Ketsi, Kwakwatlam, Musqueam, uh, Semiamu, and Sawasan peoples, and Kekai. Much of our talk focuses on the history of how this land came to be appropriated by settlers and how those indigenous nations in particular resisted that appropriation. And this talk is kind of part of our effort to unsettle the settler, the, the settle, settler idea that this situation is already settled and to raise awareness of these histories and ensure that um, especially our non-Indigenous colleagues at and beyond KPU know these histories as well. Um, I also want to just make sure that everyone knows there's a content note in this talk. Obviously, we're going to be discussing some um, mostly discursive, but in some cases, actual enacted anti-Indigenous violence and racism, uh, as well as in one case, death. Um, so please take care of yourselves as needed as you're listening to this talk. And I also want to thank the organizers 
And um, as Fatima said, just please be aware that the talk is being recorded. And if you don't want your face to be recorded or um, your comments just to um, stay muted and with your video off. So as I mentioned, my name is Maddie and I'm a historian here at KPU. I greeted you just now in Halkamalum, a language spoken a little bit further upriver here, uh, up the Fraser, by Stalo peoples. And I want to thank my mentor and teacher, Lamlamala Wilelik, Laura Wilelik, for all her efforts to revitalize that language so it can still be learned today. I'm a white settler. My heritage is from England, Ireland, Scotland, Germany, and the Netherlands. And I'm part of the fourth generation of my family to be occupying unceded and untreated lands of... Uh, but broadly, Hulkmilum speaking peoples here in southwestern BC. And so as someone in those personal and professional positions, it's really important to me to use my privilege as well as my academic role to try to start to help undo some of the harms of settler colonialism, in particular by asking other settlers to rethink what they think they know about Indigenous settler relations. I'll turn it over to Natasha. Hi everyone, my name is Natasha McConnell and I'm a recent KPU graduate and a current MA history student at UBC. I'm a cisgender female presenting settler woman of British, Irish and Russian Ukrainian ancestry whose family immigrated to Canada mainly in the 20th century. I was raised in a middle class household on traditional unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Because of my privileged social position in the settler colonial framework, I've had the freedom to live uncritically on stolen land, but that's come at a cost to First Nations and other less privileged groups. Like Maddie, I really wanna use my privilege and my academic position to try and undo some of the damage on settl of settler colonialism, not least by thinking critically about the land I live on. So um, before we dive into our talk, um, I want to begin by introducing a bit of a working definition of the idea of Indigenous sovereignty. And so here I'm drawing uh, from scholars like Michelle Rahea, Elrique Whitehouse, and Eileen Moreton Robinson and the work that they've shared with us. So Indigenous sovereignties are nation-specific forms of governance that have existed since time immemorial and which shape uh, which take shape rather through local understandings and expressions, they come from the creator and community's connections to land. Indigenous sovereignties affirm a community's relationship to their land, their rights and responsibilities to their territory and to each other, both within families and communities and between communities and nations. And while of course, we can, I think, all easily understand that Indigenous sovereignties existed prior to European arrival, it's equally important to recognize that they did not diminish afterwards. So Indigenous sovereignty continues to exist as a legitimate force despite the violence of settler colonial impositions. And Indigenous sovereignties are no less significant, important, or real than European sovereignties. I'll turn it over to Natasha to introduce us to the McKenna McBride Commission. So to properly understand what the McKenna McBride Commission and our entire source base is, it's important to understand why reserves in BC in particular are so complicated. Prior to Confederation, reserve establishment was left to the purview of whichever governor oversaw the British colony on Vancouver Island. So in the 1850s, James Douglas established the Douglas Treaties on Vancouver Island, and his policy on the mainland was more or less to go to nations to set posts in the ground with their consultation, but without proper treaty or purchase, which will come in play later. His successor, Joseph Tretch, had a different opinion. Uh, he thought that Douglas's reserves were too generous. And as early as the 1860s, Tretch began to work on how best to cut down reserve size in BC. After Confederation in 1871, complications increased because while Indigenous peoples were considered to be under the purview of the federal government, land and resource issues were a provincial matter. And provincial and federal governments, shockingly enough, do not always play nice. Prior to McKenna McBride, a few other commissions attempted to straighten out the issue of BC reserves, uh, in particular the 1875 Joint Indian Reserve Commission, but nothing really seemed to work. To, going back to what Maddie said about sovereignty not being diminished, First Nations were not passive victims of colonial bureaucracy in this. 
multiple pan-Indigenous or activist organizations, including the Interior Tribes of British Columbia and the BC version of the Indian Rights Association pictured here, began pressuring the Dominion government to settle the land issue. In 1906, a delegation of Coast Salish leaders, led by Chief Joe Capilano and also pictured on this slide, traveled to London to petition the British King for recognition of Indigenous land title. It was this continuous pressure by First Nation activists combined with federal political changes that actually led to the creation of the Royal Commission on Indian Affairs in the province of British Columbia, which is the very long name for what is colloquially known as the McKenna McBride Commission. It was a joint provincial federal government commission with the goal of surveying BC reserve lands, taking indigenous testimony and recommending a final reserve system. First Nations, meanwhile, took the commission as an opportunity to not only discuss their reserve land, but to have a variety of different complaints be heard. Throughout the testimony, Indigenous speakers took the time to discuss their relationship with settler organizations, their access to jobs, and their issues with many government regulations that were outside of the Commission's purview. The Commission traveled around the province from 1913 to 1916, and it made final recommendations that would technically add to the size of many reserves, but which would decrease the average monetary value of the land by almost 85%. Despite protests, an amended version of the Commission's recommendations, maps of which you will see throughout this presentation, were implemented beginning in 1922. I'll pass it over to Maddie again. So um, in this talk, uh, we're going to be drawing on those testimonies from the Commission um, because they give us really excellent insight into Indigenous concerns about their land, um, about their community's rights, as well as about um, rights to uh, fishing, hunting, and a variety of other activities in an increasingly settled um, province. Um, specifically, we're going to be focusing on these six different nations and speakers from them because, of course, our university, KPU, has a relationship of respect and of responsibility towards those communities. And we hope that this talk can help advance awareness at KPU of some of these longstanding grievances. Um, but also we'll see many of these issues are still deeply significant today. Um, so this talk isn't the effort, isn't an effort to kind of say the final word on anything, but rather to kind of introduce and expand awareness of the commission and its legacy today. Um, and also of letting people here at the university know what Natasha and I are, are both interested in, the work that we're doing, um, and for an opportunity for us to share what we know so far um, with the potential of maybe reaching out to work in collaboration um, and just to really set the stage to begin to do some of this work in a good way. We, Natasha and I both have different interests when it comes to our plans for how we want to continue to explore McKenna McBride, but something that's really key for both of us is respecting the Indigenous communities um, whose pasts and presents are caught up in the legacy of this commission and its recommendations over 100 years ago. And we want to do work that is going to be useful and valuable to those nations. And um, so as you're listening, I hope you'll kind of consider any thoughts or ideas you have for us on that front. <clears throat> You're also going to notice, I think, a few key themes that come up here as we explore these testimonies, um, and in particular about how they inform us about local Indigenous sovereignties in the 1910s. We're going to see that in different ways, Indigenous speakers from this region relied on and explained their communities' long-standing connections to the land, and in so doing, contesting settler claims to it. Um, several of the speakers also explain how they want that long history of pre-contact relationship with their territories to be translated into present and future rights in the context of the settler state, especially vis-a-vis self-determination, regarding ownership and usage of reserve land, but also rights to hunt and fish and to access clean water and healthcare. Secondly, as our talk is going to show, the speakers are far from the stereotypical insulting portrayal of the naive Indian that circulated in the early 20th century and still um, in some cases circulates today in pop culture. And rather, the Indigenous speakers to the commission who we're going to be discussing um, were 
powerful diplomats and advocates who strategically applied colonial ideas in their statements to convince the commissioners of the strength of their claims. So, for example, people state their desire to use the land properly by adopting settler farming, or by couching their land claims in Christian rhetoric, or by referencing crown and colonial officials like the Queen or James Douglas, or by taking on settler gender roles, all as evidence of their respectability and in pursuit of being convincing when it comes to affirming their rights to their land. And as we move through these testimonies, we'd also like you to pay attention to the power of the speaker's words, many of which we'll have up on the screens for you. The commission ultimately didn't recommend significant cutoffs from the reserves of the communities that we're gonna be speaking about today. And we think this is possibly in part due to the strength and reliability of the testimony made by indigenous speakers in this region. So in order to demonstrate all of this, Natasha is going to speak first about initial findings regarding Musqueam, Semiamu, and Sawasan testimonies from 1913 and 1914. And then I'm going to share key ideas from Katie, Coquitlam, and Kwantlen testimonies from 1914 and 1915. And then by way of conclusion, I'll discuss how and why I think this information relates to those of us who work at KPU and live in the territories of these nations. Okay. On June 24, 1913, Chief Johnny of the Musqueam Nation thanked the members of the Royal Commission for their long-awaited visit to his reserve. As discussed, the Commission was in no small part the result of long-standing activist efforts from Indigenous groups, and as early as his first sentence, Chief Johnny highlights both the long effort and his own sense of ownership over his land. There's two sort of main grievances that Chief Johnny talks about when he discusses with the Commission. First, Earlier cutoffs. He describes how Sir Douglas initially consulted with the Musqueam people in placing the post in accordance with their wishes and explaining to the First Nations that the land outside would be the Queen's and inside would be for the Musqueam. Chief Johnny's statement calls upon both the Queen and Douglas's higher authority figures and allies his own position to them. He then goes on to say how those authority figures were ignored. The land apportioned to the Musqueam people had been decreased twice since Douglas first established the reserve boundaries. And in the process of the rejections, he explains that the Indians were not notified or consulted when it took place. And after that, three persons came here to Musqueam and, took some of the and told some of the Indians that the posts that Sir James Douglas had planted meant nothing at all, clearly criticizing the colonial government for ignoring their own leaders and authority figures. The reduction of reserve land brought up further issues for Chief Johnny, agricultural space. As Maddie explained, farming was one of the ways that the commission considered land to be properly used. So if people said that they were planning to use the land for farming, that could be a justification for them. Through his statement, Chief Johnny highlighted how the Musqueam were putting in active effort to establish settler forms of cultivation on their reserve lands, including leasing land to Chinese farmers from whom they were learning agricultural techniques, and even having people move off reserve because there was not enough space for them to cultivate the land properly. To me, that read as a justification, an explanation to the commission as to why there might not be the amount of cultivation that the commission would want to see. It might even have been a way to prevent reserve reduction or subtly request a reserve expansion. His second main grievance concerns broader government regulations around resource use. I want to specifically highlight his discussion of fishing rights. Indigenous hunting and fishing rights were different from settler rights in the 20th century, and First Nation fishers could catch a certain amount for personal use within their reserve lands without license. Though it was up to local Indian agents and government officers to respect those rights, and they were not always consistent. Chief Johnny tells the story of how one time he took ill, so he sent two men to get salmon for him to have as his winter food. He said, they, the men I sent, were only there one day and an officer came along and took the net away from them. When the commissioners questioned why he did not seek a license from the fishery office, it was revealed that such permits had been refused to the Musqueam for unknown reasons. In face of this, the chairman of the commission attempted to justify the fishing regulations, comparing it to the story of the man who killed the golden goose and explaining that overfishing had already had catastrophic consequences in eastern Canada. Chief Johnny agreed, but it wasn't the First Nations fault that the goose was dead. The Indian custom, he said, of taking fish was only by means of a small net, 
and they only caught very few so as not to destroy the fish. That is the reason I say I did not destroy the fish. It is the white man that brought the long nets and catch all kinds of fish. Overall, Chief Johnny explains that he wanted non-interference, both in terms of land use and in terms of resource use. He discusses his current situation like this. Just like as if I am between two persons, one person is on my right and one person is on my left saying, I have a share of your reserve and I want those two persons to let my hands go and give me control of my own land. When I want to go fishing, the two parties are also holding onto each end of my boat and I want that I, and I know that I own the water. That is the grievance that I want to bring before you, before the commissioners. I don't want to have a license to do anything at all. When I want to catch fish for my living, I don't want to be interfered with at all. We go to the next slide, please. On June 26, two days after hearing Chief Johnny in the Musqueam Nation, the commission came to speak with Chief Sam of the Semiamu. Speaking through Jimmy Charlie, an interpreter, Chief Sam said plainly that he wanted to own my land in the proper way, end quote. When prompted for clarification, Chief Sam agreed with the chairman that he wanted to own the land in the same way as a white man. Inheritance was a very key feature to Chief Sam's speech. He spoke of his own inheritance, saying, My people lived here all the time, and I was raised here, and I think I am going to be here all my life. I would not leave this place at all, and that is the reason I am glad you people have come here today. I am not going to say too much. All I want is to get to own the place. Charlie George, who spoke after Chief Sam, further clarified the chief's statement explaining that the Semiyama's ultimate desire was, quote, to have a title to our land in severality. Jimmy Charlie, the interpreter, was next called, and he too spoke to the Semiyama desire regarding legal land ownership. He negated the idea that the Semiyama wanted the land rights to be able to sell the land, and indicated that he would instead want a structure similar to the one already in place, only each head of household would have a part of the reserve to be their own land, which they could pass on to descendants. Again, inheritability of land was a central feature. A small but important part of the title discussion is that when asked, Charlie George specifically said that they would not be willing to pay taxes if they held title. This, I think, shows a desire for recognition without governance, a desire for indigenous lands to be considered somewhat akin to a different country in terms of Canada's control over them. Another key discussion was again, farming. Specifically, the desire of the Semiamu to farm and their fiscal inability to do so. Charlie George spoke very clearly about the position of the Semiamu. He said, I'm glad to see you come over to settle about the land question. I would be glad to own the place, only the Indians cannot farm without the money. If they stopped work, they could not make their living, so that keeps the Indians back from farming like the whites. This statement, I think, clearly shows that First Nations were very aware of the ways that the Commission understood proper land usage specifically because he equates owning the place with farming. The primary excuse for the Semiamu here was financial, as seen with both Charlie George's statement and in Jimmy Charlie's words about money for farming equipment, rather than space requirements like we saw with the Musqueam. Could you go to the next slide, please? Several months later, on April 28, 1914, Chief Harry Joe welcomed the commission to the Tuasin Reserve. Speaking through Simon Pierre, who acted as interpreter, Chief Harry Joe just came out and freely said what the commission meant for First Nations and how they would use it as a political platform. He said, I have been speaking to the men appointed to look after our interests in British Columbia, but all our words seem to go unheard. Therefore, I shall repeat the same words I have spoken about in former days. In the rest of his opening statement, Chief Harry Joe introduced the commission to his people's creation story. He said, we have been in this place from time immemorial, and I'm going to explain to you gentlemen how our ancestors were created in this place right over here at the highland known as Scale Up or English Bluff. That is the place where the first man of this race was created, and the Indians used to claim that whole highland where they were first created. Swasson had also drawn up two petitions, with Chief Harry Joe presented to the commission. I'm going to focus on the first petition, which explains once more that the lands belonged to the Tawasson from time immemorial. It went on to discuss First Nation freedom of movement before settler colonial reserves. The petition then demanded title for the land, complaining that both the Dominion and provincial government wanted a share of the land and that, quote, us Indians says that we own the land. The petition continues, we stand and ask for a clear title of our land 
and then we'll know what land we are using, and we'll know that it belongs to nobody but to us. We know that the land is by means of our living. That is the reason we want to get our title to our land. There's one piece of land that was specifically requested and talked about in the petition, and that's the water frontage of the reserve, which they wish to reclaim. The petition highlights that the frontage had always been an important place for catching fish and digging up clams, and that the Tawasan people wanted to continue to use it for those practices. But they added in that in the summertime, they used the same frontage to grow grains and hay and as a pasture for livestock. Again, pulling in colonial ideas of proper land usage. There is also a discussion about the issue of individual title, like there was with the Semyamu. George Swanset, an indigenous man who spoke after Chief, uh, Chief Harry Joe, confirmed the chief's assertion that the Tsuasan people wanted individual title to the land, such that each head of Hanley received title for one specific part. Like Charlie George, George Swanset rejected the idea of paying taxes, instead highlighting title as a means of ensuring non-interference. George Swanset went on to say, the two governments and us, that makes three people who own this piece of land. I want to have this land so no one can come and take it. The commission was very concerned that the Tawasin wanted to sell the land and that was why they were asking for title. But Chief Harry Joe in his closing statement insisted, the reason we are asking for the title, it is not for to sell the land we are asking it, but to save troubles amongst ourselves. That is the reason I explained to you gentlemen that our land is not for to sell, but to keep all the time. Pass it to you, Maddie. Thanks, Natasha. <clears throat> okay, just get myself situated here as well. So on April 29th of the same year, 1914, the commissioners then went to speak with Katsi leaders. Either in lieu of or in addition to speaking it out loud, Chief Joe Isaac submitted a written welcome. Um, which is pictured here, uh, as well as a memo of his community's grievances to the commissioners. And we assume that these were written by a local priest or missionary. They have the same handwriting, these two different documents, um, though they aren't signed except by Isaacs. But the, the welcome letter uh, is written in deeply Christian language, appreciating the capital S spirit, which prompted the commissioners to come and talk to the Catesy. The letter concludes with an effusive passage expressing happiness, quote, to know that you are bringing the Bible of the Almighty God with you, unquote, and that affirms God created the whole world, is the king of all men, and will eventually judge everyone in the afterlife. And whether these sentiments are arising from uh, authentic feeling or from a uh, kind of level of strategy, uh, strategy um, it's difficult, impossible to discern, but either way, it, it does some work here of trying, of assuring the commissioners of the Christian spirit of the Catesy people before listing their land claims concerns. Um, the memorial then, the second document of Catesy grievances, centers around the request entirely, mainly for better and larger farming land. Um, so similarly to what Natasha has been speaking about. As with the gestures towards Katie Christianity, couching these grievances as a requirement for farmland may also have been a strategic choice. Um, the commissioners were absolutely more sympathetic to Indigenous people who wanted to adopt settler farming practices. First, though, the memorial asked for 160 acres of land for each adult man in their community. And this request shows a high degree of familiarity with settler practice because in Canada, this was the amount of land that a British male subject could preempt or gain lawful and sole access to, as long as he declared that it was for farming purposes. Secondly, the memorial requested that land from the Catesy Reserves at Barnston Island and Pitt Lake be exchanged for equal amounts of land at their main reserve, respectively 135 and 340 acres. The memorial's last grievance pointed out that the reserve land had actually lost 84 acres in a previous reserving, and this implied that that land should be returned as well. The grievance then concludes by asking the government to acknowledge the Casey community's permanent and full rights or ownership to our present reservation and to assist with resolving those claims and provide written agreement to that effect. 
So all of this then demonstrates uh, very careful accounting of Catesy land and also very clear knowledge of how things should work in a uh, settler bureaucracy. Um, and so then I think taken as a whole, these two documents show Catesy leaders demonstrating their familiarity with and willingness to work within settler systems as long as they got treatment that was at least on par with what settlers could expect. So here I think then we see even through a Christian intermediary and framed within a God-fearing context, Chief Isaacs is taking a stand for his community and demanding at minimum equality under Canadian law. Um, early the next year though, Chief Isaacs spoke again to commissioners at the end of their meeting with Kwantlen leaders. Um, and instead of presenting written remarks on this occasion, Isaacs spoke to them directly. So there is no concern about kind of like a, a Christian intermediary here. This is his own words uh, being read directly and then or being said directly and then transcribed. Um, and he, his concern here is about Dr. Drew, who was the medical doctor appointed by the government as the person in charge of health care for the Katsi and Kwantlen communities. As Chief Isaacs explained, and I'm going to quote him at length here, quote, when he is sent for by any of us, he don't come. We have to take the sick people down to the doctor in New Westminster, and sometimes he or she is pretty low. Instead of the doctor coming up, we have to take them down, and sometimes they die as a consequence of having to be taken down in an open gasoline boat. And in the case of one woman of the Catesy Reserve, Mrs. Louisa, she died giving birth to a child because the doctor would not come when we sent for him. His reply when I phoned him was that his agreement with the government did not cover such cases and that he had nothing at all to do with it. I reported it to Indian agent McDonald and he reported it to the Ottawa government and the doctor said he wanted an increase in salary in a case where he would have to attend a woman giving childbirth, unquote. Now, in the face of this upsetting, tragic news, the commissioners did seem to be affected. Oftentimes they just brushed um, the chief's testimony like this off. But in this case, um, they, they, it did make an impact in that they asked follow-up questions and promised to address the issue as soon as possible. Um, but I haven't yet been able to find any documentation that um, indicates that they actually did do that, unfortunately. So at the second meeting then, we can see that Chief Isaac's concerns are not solely focused on the land and on farming, but extend to the well-being of his community more broadly as well. His advocacy then for better medical treatment for Katesy and Kwantlen um, emphasizes that sovereignty includes the responsibility of caring for people in addition to taking care of the land. Early the next year, on January 8th, 1915, the commissioners met with the Kwikwetlam community. After Commissioner McKenna introduced the scope of the commission to the people at the meeting, Kwikwetlam Chief David Bailey took the floor. He addressed the commissioners about a grievance on our present reserve, saying that, quote, there's, there was enough land surveyed for this in early days, unquote, but that more recently parts of it had been taken away. And as a result, quote, we the band came to a decision that our land is hardly, hardly large enough for the band. Therefore, we ask your assistance to have our reserve enlarged for what land we have now is only sufficient enough for the older families and nothing for younger people, unquote. Chief Bailey explained more fully through interpreter Simon Pierre that the successive reductions of reserve size were extensive. He estimated the initial reserve was around 600 acres, and it had since been diminished down to 202.5 acres. And then in another resurveying, the contemporary reserve amounted to only 6.5 acres. So this is a tremendous reduction. This experience of successive reserve size reductions was common in BC. For instance, in the Fraser Valley in 1864, land surveyor William McCall worked with Stalu people to identify and mark off 14 reserves amounting to 39,400 acres. Four years later, though, those reserves were reduced by Joseph Tretch, Chief, Chief Commissioner of Land and Works, um, and he slashed the reserves down to uh, by over 90%, down to 3,430 acres. Um, so the Coquitlam perspective there then of going from 600 acres to just over six or a 99% reduction demonstrates how extreme the land 
loss was to their community and how important then also it was that their reserve not be reduced further. In his grievance to the commissioners then, Chief Bailey goes on to discuss two additional issues, water quality and hunting and fishing rights. The chief explains that while his community is used to drinking from the Coquitlam River, the increase in white settlement has led to pollution because both the Riverview Hospital and the growing city of Coquitlam were, quote, dumping everything dirty and filthy into the river, unquote. Since the water isn't then fit for potable use, the chief requests a, a supply of good water. Additionally, Chief Bailey tells the commissioners that the Coquitlam used to get their hunting and fishing permits for free, but now they're being asked to pay for them, and that this is a barrier to their, quote, freedom to get our living by our fish, unquote. He also explains that Coquitlam people should be allowed to sell any fish that they have to spare, quote, as you understand fully well that we cannot live on fish straight, for we must have our flour and sugar and tea, unquote. These two issues relate again to concern then for community health and well-being. Chief Bailey, like Chief Isaacs, is using this commission not only to air significant concerns about the loss of land, but also to advocate for inherent Indigenous rights of his community, to clean water, to hunt and fish as formerly. And these latter rights were, at the time, already protected um, for many First Nations in Canada who had signed treaties, um, though since BC hadn't entered into treaties with most First Nations in the province, they didn't have those rights affirmed by settler pro uh, promises. And of course, we know also that treaty promises were largely not kept, but at least in other contexts, they had been affirmed, and that wasn't the case in BC or for these nations. <clears throat> So then <clears throat> the next day, January 9th, 1915, Kwantlen community members met with commissioners. Chief Casimir spoke first, and um, I'm going to read this long quote, but I've put it on the slide for you as well. Quote, I'm very glad to see you here on my reserve. It is through my hard work and the hard work of the first chief that these reserves were surveyed out. Very many times I have told the Victoria government about our grievances and we never got any satisfaction. Today, I am telling you that I own the land and it don't belong to anyone else. I own the land and I own the water. I have never had anyone to help me out with the government. The white men have taken our land and we have never got anything. During the time Simon Fraser came here, my grandfather was up at Sapperton. When he came, they were kind to him. Was it because the Indians were too kind to him that the government is not going to give us a square deal? I'm tired now of waiting for compensation from the government. I would sooner see you kiss the Bible after me so that I know that you are going to do the square thing, unquote. Every time I read these words, I am struck by how powerful they are and how they could almost still be said today now in 2024 also. Chief Casimir is obviously not only extremely frustrated with the process of the commission and the history of settler bureaucracy in regards to their appropriation of Kwantlen lands. We also see here very clear claims to land ownership, even when directly contrasted with settler incursions and appropriations of that land, indicating that Chief Casimir believed his rights to his land continue regardless of settler colonial impositions on it. Embedded through all of this is a direct challenge to the commissioners themselves and to settler colonialism broadly, right, broadly writ to do the right thing and to satisfy Kwantlen grievances. Like Chief Bailey, Chief Casimir is also quite strategic in focusing on avoiding additional reductions to reserve size. There's a repeated idea in his testimony that he is not asking for reserve increases. He is simply asking for the size of his community's reserves to be kept the same as they currently are. So while the chiefs understand that they have underlying sovereign rights to their land, they also know full well that they are now faced with a settler process that they have to work within, and they're doing their best to avoid additional loss on top of the losses that they have already accrued. I've got a second slide for Kwame here. On the same day uh, that Chief Casimir spoke, we actually have uh, some testimony from a woman, uh, which is great and also rare in the context of the commission. So Mrs. Joseph Gabriel presented a petition to the commissioners, which was read aloud into the record. 
Women rarely made statements to the commission, so Mrs. Gabriel's testimony is remarkable and really significant. Just as Chief Bailey had been the previous day, Mrs. Gabriel was concerned about the lack of clean water. She began her petition by saying, quote, excuse me, sirs, as I am a woman and desire to ask a favor of you, unquote. And she went on to explain that, commu that the community needed a clean source of drinking water as the river water they historically drank from had become polluted due to settler colonial land appropriation, as well as disrespectful animal husbandry and an utter lack of proper sewage and water maintenance. Quote, very often we would see a dead pig, horse, or cow drifting down the stream, and in summer the water is dirty and muddy so that no one can bear to drink it, unquote. She added that upriver, some people's outhouses and sewage pipes spill into the water and that that effluent is carried downstream. She asserted that the government had both the responsibility as well as the ability to afford to provide clean water to her community, both because of the natural right to clean water and because of funding from the Department of Indian Affairs. And Mrs. Gabriel closes her petition by signing it, quote, in the name of the women of the Langley Reserve, unquote. Now, here again, we see the same theme of concern for community health and welfare, but it's coupled in this case with explicitly gendered care. This repeated affirmation of Gabriel's womanhood likely played well to the commissioner's Eurocentric ideas of chivalry that a woman should be able to count on from men, as well as separate spheres ideology. Gabriel's framing her concerns really as a domestic matter, an approach that would have aligned with Euro-Canadian settler ideas that women are responsible for the domestic well-being of their families. On the other hand, the face of Gabriel, the, the fact of Gabriel's participation in this overtly political forum, um, in that sense, would have maybe challenged some of the commissioner's ideas about gender, as the commission is um, really a very male space. And so in that sense, her testimony does show rejection of those same norms. And this is especially the case considering her request is for sure also a critique of current settler colonial land and water usage and stewardship. And interpreted in that manner, it's also possible and I think to see Gabriel's statements as implicitly affirming indigenous sovereignty. Her decision to step in and provide this petition also emphasizes that within the context of her own indigenous community, women could hold important social roles that included more full participation in all aspects of community life. <clears throat> and uh, I can see we're running out of time here, but I'm just going to take a few minutes to conclude then. So how does this, all of this, connect back then to KPU and to today? I know it's been a lot of information, might feel like a lot to process, um, and these are definitely ideas and themes that Natasha and I have been thinking about for a while um, since she took a class uh, with me um, that focused on McKenna McBride. And it's a subject we're going to continue to be thinking through um, probably for years to come. But a key point we'd like you to try to hold on to from this talk is that the McKenna McBride testimonies from local Indigenous nations reveal the strength of these communities' resistance to settler colonialism and their powerful and strategic expressions of their sovereignty in the face of those incursions. And local Indigenous peoples today, their concerns about land back, about clean water, about health care, and about rights, these are not coming out of thin air. These are ongoing intergenerational concerns dating back more than 150 years. And I think, you know, the majority of us who work and study at KPU are not Indigenous people. And of course, none of us are directly responsible for the histories of settler encroachment onto the territories of these nations. But those histories absolutely have enabled us to be here, to live here. And so we do benefit from them. And these histories and their legacies are important for us at KPU to know about not just because of our location on the territories of these nations, but also, and I think really notably, something that can kind of almost be glossed over because we say it so often, is the gift from Chief Joe Gabriel of the name Kwantlen to our institution when it was created in 1981. 
when an Indigenous name is gifted, especially to a non-Indigenous person or organization, it is a tremendous honour, certainly, but it also comes with a responsibility to the people who gifted the name. Bearing an Indigenous name means being held in relation with the people that the name comes from, and it means being accountable to them. And I think KPU is absolutely trying to do this in some ways that I applaud, um, and a lot of these are embedded in the Chayil Pathway to Systemic Transformation document, which if you haven't read yet, I really encourage you to do so. But it's also work that is bigger than any one individual, and it will take time beyond any one single life to address these wrongs. And so we hope you come out of this talk recommitting to your role in that process, whatever it might be. Thank you so much for listening, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, um, Maddie and Natasha. What a deep, real, and important talk. Um, so I'm uh, now opening it to questions, comments. I'm just seeing in the chat, um, Melinda saying that uh, Mrs. Joe Gabriel is the grandmother of Cheryl Gabriel. And yeah, I, I wanted, I, I wasn't totally sure about that, Melinda, but I knew there must be a connection there. So thank you for affirming that. Yes, Jamie. Hi, thank you, Natasha and Maddie so much. Um, it was Chief Casimir whose quote really struck me where he said, I own the land, I own the water. And it really made me think about what I have learned recently about the Indigenous and First Nations worldview of not owning the land, of being part of the land, of being part of the water. And so when you were sharing that quote, I thought, well, is this his way? Was this his way of working within the colonial system to try to get somebody to listen? Is that is did I interpret that correctly? Yeah, Natasha, do you want to reply? That's that's more or less the impression that I got from all of the various testimonies. Um, keep in mind that for a number of these speakers, they were speaking through interpreters as well. So there could have been words which didn't translate directly and ownership was just sort of the main word that was used um, when it was transcribed. And we don't know what the original word was because they, they wrote it down all in English. But yeah. that's very much the impression that I got was the use of the word ownership and the use of an engagement with the, con the concept of title was a way of working within a system that refused to listen to them if they did not use these words. Thank, thank you so much for sharing and, and it's really it's really powerful as well the quote around the water and this mm -hmm. is still something that seems so natural and seems so normal and so logical so um thank you so much both both uh, both of you thanks Uh, Melinda, do you want to, I don't know if you are open to this, but if you are, I'll just say that I'd love to hear more about what you might know about Mrs. Gabriel. Um, and I didn't know she was a Sapas, and I've done some work with Bill Sapas, Um And oh, so cool. that's amazing. Uh, but yeah, if you if you have anything else you, you'd want to say about that, I'd love to hear it. Uh, all, all I know is that um, Brandon and I are sort of listening in the background and then um, we're just chatting because his mom or his grandmother who just passed, Maureen, is um, was married to Joe. So we're kind of laughing about how Joe, um, uh, Joe Jr., which is his grandpa, was, you know, the one of the children of uh, Mary Sapas and Alfred Joe Gabriel. And it's interesting just seeing how how that those names come up in the government documents, but that's not how they're referred to in the community. And it's kind of always like that. 
yeah. in Indigenous communities. So you actually have a hard time connecting who is who unless you actually know people's legal names. So the colonial interpretation of someone's identity also differs um, from, you know, the interpretation from your own family. Kind of interesting, but this is a great presentation, Maddie. Well done. I love seeing Chief Casimir in here. He's such a baddie. I know he looks. So, you could just see him giving the same mean mug to the commissioners, right? Like this is at the Fort Langley Centennial, mm -hmm. and I just imagine him sitting there and being like, "Why are we celebrating this fort?" <laughs> like, <laughs> but yeah, no. I, I and I think what you said actually goes back to Jamie's question too, right? About like the um like the specific words that are showing up in these English transcriptions of probably um, it's, it's first translated and then transcribed, right? So there is definitely some slippage and some loss um, that like what we have today, I think is still really meaningful to explore, but it's still not like it's close to what was said, but it's not what was said. And similar, like, just as you were saying about identities too, not being, um, accurately captured in any of this. Yeah. Thanks, Melinda. Holly. Hi. Thank you so much for this really interesting talk and for, I, it's I haven't spent a lot of time looking at the specifics in the way that you have looked at them here with the quotes that are in this context, this particular place. And so I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on your thoughts of how KPU's documents and the framework relate to the specific issues that are being raised um, in the quotes that you have talked about here. Yeah, thanks. Um, Natasha, do you have thoughts on that or do you want me to say something first? And I know that um, we kind of agreed that Natasha's now at UBC, so she may not be <laughs> as familiar, but I do want to leave space if you have anything you want to add. Um, yeah, Holly, I think that that's a, a really great question. I think like a lot of the uh, Hale document, like it talks about um, like thinking about uh, including Indigenous voices, centering Indigenous voices. And I feel like we can learn a lot specifically from these transcripts, even acknowledging the issues that we've all just mentioned uh, about them. Um, I also think, you know, there is this challenge that universities across Canada have to consider as we all adopt the frameworks and the discourse of reconciliation, especially, but also EDI. Um, what what is that actually going to look like here? Um, and, you know, we all just saw a certain university in Ontario change their name to Toronto Metropolitan University. I wonder what's on the horizon for that with SFU. Are they going to keep the name of someone who was a very violent, actually, individual as he moved his way uh, along the river also that now bears his name? Um, uh, when I asked that question, when I was like, uh, you know, upstart young grad student and I asked that question at a talk um the president of SFU at the time uh Andrew Petter had this answer that was clearly in the can and he just said well you know it's on all our branding now it's part of who we are I was like oh wow okay well imagine what you would get if you changed that up right imagine what other relationships you could open. Um, and, and I think that that's something that uh, is really important. And I, I did kind of talk about it with regards to the name, um, like having this name Qualen, I think means that we really do have to do a better job. And I know like there's so many people at KPU now who are committed to that, um, but it's it's going to take a lot of really important relationship building work. Um, and I'm hoping this is the beginning of that. I also think that um, the decision to allow um, students from the nations that we've talked about today, the nations whose territories campus, KPU campuses are on, to attend the university for free, I think that's also an amazing beginning, 
um, into this, right? Um, to allow, uh, not for free, but to at least not have to pay tuition. Um, that's, uh, I think, maybe the start, or it could be an overture towards starting to work better. Um, something that I would love to see is co-taught classes. Um, there's not really a framework that I understand right now for me to be able to co-teach a class um, with an elder or a knowledge keeper um, locally. But I know that that would be an amazing experience, right? And I, I think also our colleagues in Indigenous Studies might be better prepared to um, facilitate a lot of that as well. But yeah, I think I, like the, this is the conversation I want to start, Holly. <laughs> Thanks. Isabel, and we also have a comment there. Isabel, do you want to go ahead? Hi, uh, thank you so much for this wonderful, uh, wonderful talk. It was extremely um, interesting and, and to hear um, just so much of the history from all around uh, where we work and, and live and play. Um, I found it really informative. Um, one of the things that really stood out to me is actually what Carrie mentioned uh, in the chat was this um, simultaneous uh, usage of um, settler colonial language and, and logic to kind of further um, indigenous nations um points and and goals and values um and and really um especially mrs gabriel's um quote and just her being involved uh, in the commission as a woman which was very um significant uh at the time and um i don't really have a, a, a specific question i just wanted to say those are some of the things that really stood out to me and maybe you can just speak a little bit more to uh, either of those and thank you so much again Thanks, Isabel and Natasha. Do um, you have other thoughts? <laughs> my main thought, language-wise, I my my particular interest with McKenna McBride revolves around land and resource usage and how that sort of legal framework was implemented. Um, so the discussion of farming as a way to be like, hey we want to do the thing that you want us to do so stop taking away the means for us to do it um and then the various things about resource usage without interference was very interesting to me uh i'm also really interested i would love to look more into the title issue because that seems to be a thing that gets brought up frequently and i'm interested to know what the difference would be with individual title or title and sobriety and a more collective title and like what the intricacies legally behind that were. So that that for me was a very interesting linguistic turn that was happening uh, throughout these testimonies. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I, I really appreciate Carrie's kind of note uh, as well in the chat, um, thinking about it like, Maybe you can't use the colonizer's tools to demolish the colonizer's house, but you can perhaps pick up an axe and um, hammer at something at least for a little while with it. And uh, maybe that's what's happening here. Um, you know, there is an amazing history of uh, Indigenous rights activists in BC um, doing this sort of thing. Um, even like much earlier in the 1800s as well. Um, Natasha alluded to it in the intro and we didn't even really get to go there, but I really recommend if you're interested in other work on this, um, both Sarah Nichols' book, Assembling Unity and Wendy Wickwire's At the Bridge, um, really key works in this. Um, and uh, of course also um, Marianne uh, and Marianne Ignace's um, book on Shikwetma history uh, has a lot of archaeology stuff, but also touching on a lot of this. So yeah, it's super key for for people who are still interested in um, you know actually thinking about reconciliation meaningfully and and what it's going to look like both on campus and off.
Well, thank you very much. Thanks again for this very powerful uh, talk and very thought provoking. There's a lot left to think with, and I'm glad that we're going to be posting the um, video to go back and you know read all these great transcripts and um, you know learn from and be inspired by. Uh, thank you. Thanks again to our great speakers today, and thank you everyone for attending. And I hope to see you again in our next session. Thank you.